This is one you won't see every day. There's actually a defect in the myocardium. There's a very, very thin wisp of contrast <clears throat> extending through the myocardium there. And there is a significant pericardial fluid collection as well, which of course is hemopericardium. But there it is. You see that just wispy thin line of contrast extending through the myocardium. And this is an acute myocardial infarct with rupture. And this is always a dramatic thing. I had a guy rupture in the ICU when I was a senior resident and uh, he just sat bolt upright and started screaming out loud. I've never seen anyone in that much pain. And uh, I always remember his, his heart rate shot up, his pressure dropped down, and I knew there was no way we were getting that guy uh, to the operating room in any kind of timely fashion, right? E even in the most emergent cases, you're going to be an hour, and there's not much to do when someone has blown their left ventricle. So my uh, treatment alternatives being limited, I gave him 10 milligrams of IV morphine, and that was pretty much it. So again, a, a real timing issue. You just don't uh, see a scan like that very <clears throat> often. All right, some endocarditis cases. This is a dramatic filling defect. And the interesting thing with uh, septic embolization, it's actually fairly rare to see the physical emboli in the pulmonary arteries. That's been my experience is it's usually just microscopic micro, you know, bacteria that are seeding into the lungs and then grow into those cavitary lesions that we saw last time. So I really don't count on seeing the physical filling defect within the pulmonary circulation in cases of endocarditis. So that said, that's a whopper. I mean, that's bigger than most pulmonary emboli uh, that are sterile for that matter. So pretty impressive chunk of infectious debris there. You can see septic emboli here. Little cavities are beginning to form in this one. And this one is, the other one there is extending to the pleural surface like any good old fashioned pulmonary infarct might. And here is the winner. There is actually a vegetation on the tricuspid valve. And talk about something I don't expect to see uh, actually visualizing on a non-gated study, the vegetation on a given infected valve is pretty rare. I read an article that said that CT scan was something like 95% sensitive for endocarditis, and it just made me roll my eyes and say, what are you basing that on? Because uh, it seemed uh, to be quite a stretch. I don't consider CT very sensitive for this. Certainly the secondary findings, the septic emboli, et cetera. But if you're going looking for vegetations on a valve, uh, this might be the only one you see. I've got a few, I suppose, but it's not very common. Um, typically with tricuspid endocarditis, you get severe tricuspid valve dysfunction. And you're seeing that here with that enormous right atrium. And of course, there's going to be tons of backflow into the hepatic veins as well here. So there is that huge filling defect in the right pulmonary artery extending out into the right pulmonary branches. And there is that vegetation and there's your IVC and hepatic venous backflow. Pretty dramatic. These are almost always IV drug users. And so, of course, the lungs look like you might think, peripheral cavitary lesions. They're small in this particular case, but sure, they, they will grow in time. All right, so that is tricuspid endocarditis. This one is a mitral valve endocarditis, and since it's left-sided, we're going to see some different manifestations. When you do see endocarditis, go and check the lines. There's a lot of debris or clot on this indwelling catheter, and that's a very common source for endocarditis. If they're not a drug user, uh, septic thrombophlebitis or a, uh, an infected line are your most common causes. So there is the vegetation here on the mitral valve. Again, don't count on it. 
but I've got a few for demonstration purposes. All right, and here we've got septic emboli as well with these small cavitary lesions up against fissure and pleural surfaces. So there is that mitral valve vegetation. Interestingly, there isn't a, this one's got septic emboli, right? So there's probably involvement of the tricuspid valve as well. There is pericardial fluid, which is probably hyopericardium, right? You can see anteriorly there. But even though this is a left-sided endocarditis, you really don't see much in terms of embolic phenomena. When you see anything in the heart, go immediately to the spleen and make sure you check the SMA as well. All right, and here are the septic emboli. Again, right up against a fissure there. All right, so that is mitral valve endocarditis, and that was a line infection. All right, one more endocarditis. This one's aortic. So this one does not have a vegetation. And by the way, on the aortic valve especially, when you look for a vegetation, in the case of endocarditis, look on the upstream side, the side where the blood flow is coming from, in this case, the aortic outflow tract. The uh, vegetations tend to be upstream, whereas fibroelastomas and other funny little valve tumors will be downstream. And I got burned on that one time, freak, freaking out on this pedunculated little density that was sticking up into the aortic root off the aortic valve, and it was just a fibroelastoma. Uh, so it's pretty reliable, especially in the aortic valve, uh, that the, the vegetation will be upstream. So no vegetation is actually visible here, but here's the finding that really seals the deal. That is a ring abscess. So this is an aortic valve infection that has eroded into the septum right adjacent to the aortic valve ring. And these are a particular treatment problem. They're really hard to get rid of. And a uh, question for you, does anybody know how these present ring abscesses? They will present with heart block uh, because this will burrow into the AV node and disrupt cardiac transmission. So there's one for your written boards. All right, pericardial fluid is present here as well. And as I was saying earlier, you want to definitely check for embolic phenomena <coughs> in the abdomen. Make sure you check the spleen, the kidneys, and of course the SMA. And so here you've got renal infarcts and splenic infarcts, wedge-shaped things extending to the periphery. There's even altered perfusion in the liver. All right, so this is aortic endocarditis with a ring abscess. Watch right there. See how it's burrowing into the septum, the very upper portion of the ventricular septum, really kind of endocardial cushion is where these are located, right where everything comes together. And there are the renal infarcts and the splenic. All right, one more time, because these are hard to see and very important. Right there, one of our best radiologists made this call. So he dropped this in the teaching file for me. We have a teaching file that I constantly pull. If you wonder if I've seen all these myself, uh, there are about a third of them are cases that I read myself. About a third of them come to me from colleagues who know that I'm a case pack rat. And about a third of them come to me through our medical malpractice and quality assurance programs. So that's how I go. Here we are on the coronal, just a nice example of that ring abscess from a different perspective. All right, aortic endocarditis. There we go. Okay, uh, well, I said no tumors, but I couldn't restrain myself in this particular case. Uh, let me make sure that, yeah, 
Okay. So there is clearly a mass in the left atrium and it's hypodense. You know, if you just had this cut, you might even say hey, that could be a myxoma. But there's a lot of ischemic change here. There are wedge-shaped infarcts of the liver, of the spleen, and throughout all the kidneys. And now look at that aorta. It is occluded. By the way, don't ever say completely occluded. I got chastised as a medical student, and I still can't say that word without sweating a little bit. Uh, occluded means completely occluded. If it's and so there's no such thing as a subtotal occlusion either, <laughs> right? Occluded just means occluded. Don't, don't uh, modify that extreme uh, superlative, right? It, uh, it's just occluded. And if it's less than occluded, then it's stenosed. All right, so what was going on here? There are the liver infarcts, the spleen infarcts, the kidney infarcts, pretty dramatic. And here is the whole story. It's an enormous lung mass that's growing down through a pulmonary vein into the left atrium and giving rise to systemic thrombus. And look at the aorta just poof, occluded. <laughs> All right, so we'll go through it again. All those infarcts. And, you know, I really harp on the presence of obvious infarcts. When you see these tiny little wedge-shaped things in the kidneys or in the spleen, they may be really small, just little microemboli, but it means something very significant. It means there is upstream source of clot, whether that's cardiac, aorta, or the segmental vessel that's supplying that organ, you need to do a very careful evaluation of that structure's arterial supply. Um, so uh, if there are anything I see blown off more that could have great significance, anything more than these tiny wedge-shaped infarcts, I don't know what they are. Now, this is obviously an extreme case, and you're, you're certainly going to go looking in this case, but I'm talking about the just one or two in the kidneys. If they're wedge-shaped, triangular, going to the edge, they have the same significance as a mess like this, and you need to go find the source. All right, so that is a dramatic case of lung cancer with invasion of the left atrium and then extensive arterial embolization. All right, and talk about extensive arterial embolization. This is a truly crazy case. This is a nodule complication. This is a biopsy. So this is almost certainly coxy because this came from Arizona, but they were going to biopsy this nodule. And unfortunately, either they mistimed things or they failed to pause the ventilator. This patient was on a, on a ventilator and they actually uh, created a bronchovenous fistula. And I think they probably also created a bronco pulmonary arterial fistula as well. But it looks as though the majority of the gas that they introduced got sucked into the pulmonary vein and got pumped through the arterial circulation. So you'll see there is, uh, there is gas obviously in the pulmonary arteries as well. I think there was a transient pressurized jet of gas there as well. But the vast majority of the gas made it into the arterial system and filled the left atrium, left ventricle, and then was pumped out to the entire body. So you can actually see it there in the aorta, uh, filled with gas on this cut as well. So this patient had a pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum, but that gas in the left ventricle is his real problem. So it got pumped out everywhere, and you can see it in the aorta here, but it's going out the celiac and SMA. It's obviously filling the liver as well. So there was the trouble-causing nodule. But look at the extent of that gas. Again, there's a little bit in the pulmonary arteries, and I think that was probably a retrograde jet because obviously there's very little in the right ventricle and you would never be able to pump gas through the pulmonary capillary bed and pump gas from the left side of the heart to the right side. I don't find that to be a believable scenario. So I think probably in passing through uh, with the needle, they created a transient pulmonary arterial 
jet as well, but then it was the Venus one that really did this patient in. And there are the soft tissue windows. Not as dramatic. This patient did not live. Yeah. Needless to say. Just for a lung nodule biopsy too. And if you ask me, that was pretty clearly coxy. With all that, uh, they call it satellite nodularity. Uh, a coxy lesion is rarely just an isolated nodule. It usually has a lot of uh, a little galaxy of nodules uh, surrounding it. And that's what that looks like to me. Of course, you know, you got to know. So uh, they buy, they still biopsy most of those here in Arizona. 